The end of the Second World War was met with riotous jubilation at victory over the Axis powers, and with the establishment of the United Nations, there was the dream of a new world order of freedom, prosperity, and peace. Even the advent of the atom bomb, the decisive weapon that ended the war, was celebrated, for it was believed it was so powerful it would render warfare obsolete. And yet, even before the guns fell silent, concerned whispers were being shared in the halls of power regarding the capitalist allies of the West and the communists in the East, who hitherto had been united against fascism. With there no longer being a common enemy to unite them, age-old rivalries and fears began to re-emerge. The Western allies of Britain, Canada, France, and America had not forgotten that the Soviet leader Stalin had worked with the Nazis to carve up Eastern Europe before Germany invaded Poland in 1939. They were also concerned about Stalin's refusal to surrender his grip on territories in Eastern Europe, which the Red Army had liberated, and his land grab in Asia during his last minute intervention in the Pacific Theater against Japan. Stalin himself, as paranoid as ever, was convinced that the Western Allies deliberately delayed the D-Day landings in order to bleed the Soviet Union of its people in an effort to weaken the vast country. The fact that American soldiers had fought in the Russian Civil War against the communists in 1919 only helped fuel his belief that after Napoleon and Hitler, the next leader to take a massive army into the Soviet Union would be American. With both America and the Soviet Union having suffered devastating surprise attacks in the war, they were both determined it would never happen again. They readied their armies to fight what would prove to be one of the most abstract conflicts in history, the Cold War. Welcome to Wars of the World. So just what is a Cold War? To put it simply, a Cold War is a state of political hostility between countries or alliances of nations that is characterized by threats of open warfare, the distribution of propaganda to spread their respective ideologies, and indirect military confrontation through a third party. We generally associate the term with the period of hostility between the US and the Soviet Union and their respective allies between the end of the Second World War and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. However, history is full of examples of such international unrest, and even today, there are countries who would be considered to be in a state of cold war with one another, such as India and Pakistan, Israel and Iran, and of course, North and South Korea. What makes the US-Soviet Cold War so unique is just how far-reaching it was, affecting every continent on Earth and the possible ramifications for all mankind if it ever turned into a hot war. The advent of jet-powered aviation, rocketry, and nuclear weapons meant that for the first time, virtually the entire globe was a potential battlefield. For that reason, it remains perhaps the most dangerous time in recorded human history. The Cold War is considered to have begun shortly after the surrender of Nazi Germany during the post-dam conference in which the three main allies, Britain, the Soviet Union, and the United States, met to discuss what to do with post-war Germany, and to an extent, Europe itself. Even before the war had begun, the Soviets had been building their Eastern Bloc by annexing the smaller countries around its borders, such as Estonia and Latvia, and they sought to secure the countries they liberated from the Nazis to bring them into that bloc, expanding their influence with puppet rulers. Short of starting another war, there was little the two Western powers could do to stop Stalin from achieving his aim 
and thus Albania, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and East Germany all fell under the influence of Moscow. Yugoslavia also became allied to the Soviets after their revolution, but retained a greater degree of autonomy than the other countries. On March 3rd, 1946, Britain's wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill uttered the now famous words to an audience in Westminster College, Missouri, that an iron curtain has descended across the continent. However, with the surrender of Japan in September of 1945, the US began to take a much harder line with the Soviets, especially across occupied Germany, which had been divided into four zones under the rule of the victorious powers. Germany's capital city, Berlin, was equally divided amongst the victors, but was located deep within the Soviet zone, something that was the source of much frustration to Stalin, who believed the city should be entirely his, for it was his troops that fought the bloody last battle there in 1945. At first, Berlin was controlled by a joint committee, but soon the Western Allies began to permit the areas of Germany under their authority to reunite into a single democratic entity, which became the nucleus for the future country of West Germany. Having the capital of this new country in Soviet-controlled territory was intolerable to Stalin, and so on June 24th, 1948, he ordered all the land routes to West Berlin be closed in an effort to force Western powers to withdraw and finally hand all the city to him. In the meantime, the people of West Berlin would slowly begin to starve. The Western powers, still reeling from their appeasement of Hitler's aggression in the 1930s, decided to confront Stalin head on. But instead of invading the eastern half of Germany, they instead organized a massive airlift to feed the population of West Berlin. Thousands of aircraft, including demilitarized bombers from the war, were pressed back into service to fly supplies into Berlin through three air corridors. At the height of the operation, planes were landing and taking off from Berlin every 30 seconds. American pilots involved in the operation famously constructed makeshift parachutes with which to drop sweets to German children as they flew overhead, while British flying boats were used to carry salt, since their hulls were designed to resist its corrosive nature. Stalin was initially undeterred by the airlift. Given the intensity of the air operations, he argued that the Western powers couldn't keep it up indefinitely, and especially on behalf of a former enemy. However, the days soon gave way to weeks, which in turn gave way to months. Eventually, Stalin was the one who had to concede by reopening the land routes on May 12th, 1949. The first major confrontation of the Cold War had been won by the Western powers, but this was only the beginning. The blockade of Berlin had proven that the Soviets were a real threat to Western Europe. Several Western European countries, such as Belgium and Holland, had declared themselves neutral when Hitler invaded westward in 1940, but this proved to be no protection. And so, their post-war governments began looking at forming military alliances to counter Soviet aggression. Britain and France had already signed a mutual defense treaty, known as the Treaty of Dunkirk in 1947. And the following year, this was expanded to include the small Benelux countries. Barely a year after this, with the blockade of Berlin well underway, negotiations began to expand the alliance even further to include, as well as additional European countries, the US and Canada. The result was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, known as NATO, which was established on April 4th, 1949, with 12 member states. NATO was founded on the premise of mutual defense, with the key point in membership being that an attack on one country by a foreign power constituted an attack on all member states. In addition, it would unify the command structure of all member states and provide an extensive common training program that turned 12 armies into one titanic one. With both sides preparing for a possible confrontation, the Western countries felt reassured by the American possession of atomic weaponry, 
which they hoped would contain Stalin behind his Iron Curtain. These weapons had effectively ended World War II and were considered so powerful that the Americans even banned Britain, who had helped develop the weapons during the Manhattan Projects, from having them, although Britain would develop their own in the early 1950s. American President Harry Truman had informed Stalin that they were working on a new superweapon at Potsdam, but Stalin already knew. His spy network had infiltrated the Manhattan Project, and he demanded that his own scientists build an equivalent weapon. The first Soviet atomic weapon, the RDS-1, was strikingly similar to the American bomb dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. On August 29th, 1949, the Soviets detonated the bomb, and it proved to be even more powerful than the scientists working on it had predicted, being the equivalent of 22,000 sticks of TNT, more powerful than the Nagasaki bomb. The test horrified Western intelligence agencies, unaware that the Soviet nuclear weapon program was so advanced. They expected it would take another five years for the Soviets to develop a bomb, by which time they would have even more powerful weapons in the form of hydrogen bombs. The test only accelerated Western weapon programs in an effort to keep them ahead of the Soviet engineers. The first nuclear arms race in history was now underway. In the immediate post-war era and into the early 1950s, the only viable way of delivering a nuclear weapon to a target was with a heavy bomber. The US initially relied on the B-29, which delivered the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, but this was eventually replaced by the awe-inspiring B-36 Peacemaker, a 10-engined giant that was conceived to bomb Nazi Germany from the continental US if Britain was ever invaded and conquered. Eventually, newer and more advanced jet types, such as the B-47 Stratojets and the now legendary B-52 Stratofortress, were entered into service. The US had an enormous advantage over the Soviets with their bomber fleets in that they were able to base them in allied countries such as Britain, Italy, and Japan, closer to their targets than if they flew directly from the US mainland. This effectively boxed in the Soviets whose leadership demanded that a force of very long-range bombers be developed to counter the American threat. These bombers would have to be able to attack the US and her allies from bases in Soviet territory. In the meantime, the Soviets had to contend with using an unlicensed copy of the B-29 known as the Tu-4. One of the most impressive of these new bombers was the four-engined Myazhyshev M4, which startled Western intelligence so much that when they saw the strange pods on the wings, they assumed they featured some advanced defensive weapon or technology. In reality, they contained small wheels to hold the wings up when on the ground. Unfortunately, Soviet engineering wasn't as advanced as the Western bomber manufacturers, and the aircraft fell short of what was expected. Another Russian design bureau, Tupolev, instead offered the 295, a design that could trace its roots back to the B-29-derived 24. While looking more like a World War II bomber, the 295 featured fuel-efficient turboprop engines, the blades of which span so fast they often broke the sound barrier at high speeds. This plane finally gave the Soviets a bomber with which to truly threaten the US, and like the B-52, it is still used by Russian forces today. Britain was unable to afford a massive force of bombers to carry its nuclear weapons like the Americans and Soviets, and so chose quality over quantity, developing three very advanced jet bombers known collectively as the V-Force. However, all three parties had to contend with increasingly sophisticated defensive weapon systems from the opposing side, such as supersonic interceptors, some of which even had nuclear weapons of their own and eventually surface-to-air missiles. Thus, all three countries began developing air-to-surface nuclear missiles, which would allow the bombers to attack their targets outside of the range of enemy air defenses. In order to protect them from being destroyed on the ground in a Pearl Harbor-style surprise attack, the US kept large numbers of their bombers airborne and armed with nuclear weapons ready to strike at the Soviets in a moment's notice. However, this practice was stopped after a series of accidents 
including a mid-air collision between a B-52 and a tanker over Spain, in which four nuclear bombs rained down on the Spanish coast in 1966. Divided along the 38th parallel, the Korean Peninsula became a tale of two nations after the end of World War II, with the northern half of the country supported by the Soviet Union and the southern by the United States. After the creation of two separate governments, the Soviets and Americans had largely withdrawn from the peninsula in 1949. However, the North lobbied Stalin to support a powerful military thrust into the South to achieve a quick victory so as to make it impossible for the US to intervene and thus unify Korea under one communist flag. Stalin approved, and in June of 1950, the world was stunned by a sudden North Korean invasion of South Korea, sparking the Korean War. The United Nations, with the United States as the principal party, rallied armed forces from 21 countries, including Australia and the UK, to repel them. The Allied forces pushed the North Koreans back north, who prior to their landings were on the verge of defeating the South. American and Allied forces pursued them across the 38th parallel and all the way to the Yalu River, but this in turn provoked China, who launched a massive invasion in support of the North Koreans, and in doing so prolonged the war until 1953, by which time an estimated 2.8 million had died. The fighting in the Korean War mimicked much of the fighting in World War II, including mass bombing raids against North Korean cities. The war saw the first jet versus jet air battles, which included Soviet pilots in MiG-15s secretly fighting American pilots, although this wouldn't be revealed until many years later. Negotiations in 1954 produced no further agreement, and the front line has been accepted ever since as the de facto boundary between North and South Korea.